thank you for making the time to come here especially to the professionals and thank you for making the time all the doctors who have agreed to be on the panel thank you for making the time for us today and always we are really really grateful for you being with us holding our hand through this journey with autism as you know forum for autism is a parent support group and today you will see over here many of us co group parents many of you all know us have met us over the years we all now have children who are teenagers adults or in their mid 20s and over the last two decades we have seen and we have tried several ways of addressing the challenges that our children face we have tried therapies just to run you through them there was the options method then there were the behavior management methods which had aba the lovas then vba i'm using these terminologies i know a lot of parents are very familiar with them then we went on to rdi and we've always tried whatever it is that we've been told works we've also looked at alternative therapies we've looked at music auditory training um horse therapy pet therapy hydrotherapy with dolphins massages ayurvedic massages and deep tissue mass massages and you know what else we've looked at medical treatments i just want to run through the list of medical treatments simply because the process of medical treatment is such that one tends to believe that it's a cure because allopathy is like that and we've looked at b12 we've looked at b6 plus magnesium we've looked at vitamin d we've looked at vitamin c we've looked at vitamin a we've looked at dmg which is dimethyl glycine we've looked at omega 3 secretin in the early 2000 cranial sacral massage therapy hyperbaric oxygen gluten free casein free diet mms which was called the min uh, miracle mineral solution which was basically chlorine chemical castration which somebody one of our co group parents said what is that and we were thankful it never came to india <laughs> chelation cleansing of mercury and then we have reached today at what we understand as stem cell therapy like i was saying when we look at the medical solutions we believe them to be cures and we are again very very thankful to have with us on this panel today the leading doctors in this field in the science and in pediatric and behavioral and developmental medicine So right away, I would call each of them to come to the panel and take their seats here and introduce those that need no introduction. I start with Dr. Rajesh Udani. As we know, he's a pediatric neurologist with Hinduja Hospital. Dr. Udani, besides thanking you for please, take it. Besides thanking you for so many things, we thank you for always making this facility available for us. <laughs> we couldn't have done a lot of things without this. Dr. Vibha Krishnamurthy, pediatric pediatrician specialized in developmental disorders from Umi Child Development Center, and again a special thank you to both Dr. Udani and Dr. Krishnamurthy for being advisories to the Forum for Autism. Dr. Naita Hegre, neurologist with the Bridge Candy Hospital. Dr. Alok Sharma, neurosurgeon, director of Neurogen and consultant at Wokhard Hospital and HOD at Sion Hospital, and Dr. Hemangi Sani, who heads the R&D of stem cell therapy. We also have with us a very very special guest, Dr. Tatiana Dais, who actually straddles both worlds. She is family. so she's part of parent support and forum for autism and she is a doctor who has done research in neurosciences in particular stem cell and she's from the uk i call her to the there's two 
I think we need one more seat. Could you please put one more chair there? And Dr. Tatiana will be sharing with us her experiences of both these worlds. I'll just run through the program the way we're going to have it today. Every organization will make a presentation and by request from a lot of doctors, we are extending the time because we really wanted to keep it tight. But so we, we are going to have this young man here help us with the timing. We are going to ring our first bell at five minutes and our second bell at seven. Sorry for keeping it so tight, but we really need to have you have your peer discussion on the panel for longer and also allow our parents to have our question answer. We re lastly, before I hand it over to them, I request everyone, and this is a request from the parents of Forum for Autism, uh, to maintain a decorum and especially a request to parents to not make this a personal consultancy. If you have personal questions or case studies that you need to address, you can always take a private consultancy with any of the doctors. Okay? We are here to discuss the larger issue today. So with that, I call Dr. Rajesh Udani, uh, sorry, Dr. Anaita Hegde to start. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you, Parul. Thank you, Forum for Autism. Uh, we're going to run through this as short and sweet as possible. My talk really is maybe the most difficult one to give in five minutes. But I'm going to try and make, give you a little understanding of stem cells, how they work, what they are, so that you can understand how we can use them down the line. So it is the first cell that we have, which when it divides, can either become an eye or a brain or a hair or a skin, heart, liver, any cell organ of the body derives itself from a stem cell. The entire body's repair system runs on the stem cells that we have within us. So you have an injury in your knee today and your cartilage gets damaged, automatically the body sends its stem cells, multiplication takes place and the repair system starts working in. Down the line, these can divide again and again and again. There is a limitless division of these cells and they keep replenishing the old cells which are there. So roughly to give you a little idea, this is how reproduction when you have the oocyte and the sperm. This is the first cell that we have which is called the morula, goes to the blastocyst. This is all happening in the first few days of life. From zero to seven days of life, the first stage takes place. Before a mum even knows that she is pregnant, she has produced the most potent stem cell of the body. And obviously the most potent one is the morula, which it has the tendency to become an entire human being. And as division keeps taking place, from one cell you make a baby and the baby develops over time, the cells get more and more differentiated and eventually they only go into three cell lines. Each of those cell lines are then uh, lead to different organs of the body. So the most potent stem cells will be the toti, omni and pluripotent, which are your embryonic stem cells. And the unipotent stem cells, uni meaning one, they can only give you one type of cell line at the end of the day, are your adult stem cells, which is what we usually use. So to put it in a nutshell, you have embryonic stem cells, you have adult stem cells. These are the sources that you can get the embryonic stem cells. Those are the sources that you can get the adult stem cells. For years, there was debate on this because was it ethical to use embryonic stem cells? Can you use fetal cells from somebody? Is a mum have the right to give it? Is science more important from abortions? You get the fetus and we use it for whatever. <coughs> that has all really changed with science today because today we have what is called the induced pluripotent stem cell. What is that? Science is so well advanced that we take a stem cell and we can genetically play with that cell and we can make an adult cell back into its own stem cell. For induced pluripotent cell, you don't need any of that. You just need any cell from your body. So if I took a hair follicle from your arm or a skin biopsy from your skin or a piece of your liver or a piece of uh, anything of your body, I can genetically play with it, turn the time back and make it an induced pluripotent cell. So I can make your stem cells out of any part of your body today without needing embryonic or somebody else's stem cells down the line. So um, how do you grow and check the quality of these stem cells? Okay, it's not just something anyone and all of us can use. So you grow them in labs, it's called culturing them. 
Then there is different mediums that you put these into. They're kept at a certain temperature, at a certain frequency. They're cultured and subcultured. You multiply these stem cells into the millions and the thousands once you have the correct one that you're looking at. Then they're frozen and they're kept in certain laboratories in the world, recognized laboratories in the world. And when someone wants to do research on stem cell, you apply for a lab, to the lab, they send you the uh, stem cells and you get them and you can start your research. But when that stem cell comes to you, you've paid millions of dollars or rupees for those cells. How do you know that those cells are really alive and doing the work of a stem cell? So we have certain things. Yes, the simplest is looking under the microscope and seeing everything. There are certain chemicals or reagents or markers that we apply on them to see that do they have the properties of the stem cell. The next is we culture them. We inject them into a mouse or into some other animal, and we see the growth of those stem cells, how they multiply and how they down the line go further down. And the last thing we do is we inject them into immune-compromised uh, rats or animals to see if they can become tumors. A stem cell at the end of the day, a cancer cell or a tumor cell, is basically a stem cell which has gone array, which has gone wrong. And it's multiplying indefinitely. That's why cancers at the end of the day are so difficult to treat, to control, and to contain. Because once multiplication starts, and once the cycle of that stem cell starts going down the line, it is virtually impossible to stop multiplication. So these are the ways you test a stem cell, and even today. So can a stem cell from one tissue? In brief, yes, it can. We can use one tissue. We can get stem cells from everything else. But as I told you, with the induced pluripotent, you can now just take a hair or a tooth or a nail or a skin biopsy, and you can make your stem cells out of that comfortably. So now where? What has the stem cell done? It's like the newest and the best thing that's happened to medicine. There's just so much advancing happening. We are so hopeful that it will give us so much over the next few years. So the first thing that it does is regenerative medicine. We use the stem cells to repair our body. Now, you sh I showed you that the young child and the newborn has the maximum amount of potent stem cells. As you grow older with age, the potency and the number of stem cells you have becomes less. So a 10-year-old child will recover from a knee injury in two days, whereas an 80-year-old man will take six months to recover from that same knee injury because he doesn't have that many stem cells to run to the site, multiply, and help him. So the regenerative capacity is maximum in youth and slowly decreases as you go with age. So where do we use this today? It is used officially in arthritis. So if someone's damaged their cartilage, they actually aspirate cartilage cells. They send it to the lab. That person's stem cells are multiplied, recreated, sent back three to six months later, injected back. The cartilage regrows, and it is used in arthritis, joint replacements, etc. So down the line for repair. The next one is transplant medicine. We now can make stem cells, and we can make organs in the Petri dishes. So there are reports of lungs being made in a Petri dish, livers being made in a Petri dish. So the, the beauty that you can actually create an organ or a piece of an organ and transplant it into someone, the best would be diabetes. Can you imagine if we could get pancreatic cells and make a little bit of pancreas, insert it into the pancreas, that person would be free, would have insulin being produced for life after that time. So there's huge advances for transplant medicine, study of diseases, and really this is where Autism is at the moment. We are learning to study autism from the stem cells of children with autism. So we take the cells from the people, we take that stem cell, we induce it back to its stem cell, and then we watch it slowly as it grows and multiplies to see where, what is going wrong, at what stage is it going wrong, where can I intervene if necessary to change the future picture. The beauty of the induced pluripotent is you can actually arrest the cycles at different stages so that you can watch it happening you can use a drug at an early stage, and that's where drugs come in. How can we use drugs? We try to use drugs at different stages of the development of the cell to give us an understanding that if I use this drug 20 years earlier, when the cell is just beginning to show me changes of Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or whatever, could I have changed or can I change the course of this disease? So with drugs, you can either change the treatment, the severity or the pathology, and these are the conditions which are largely being studied, but this is where the studies in autism at the moment are studying what is different in the cell of a child with autism, when does it become different in the cycle, what is making it go different, and when can I intervene at the earliest stage to see if I can change something. 
So the next is how do you monitor these cells? I've given you an injection of cells. What happens to that? That cell has the potential to become any cell in the body. What tells you that it's going to become a brain cell or a nerve cell or a muscle cell or a heart cell? There's nothing that tells you. So first we growth and culture, then we monitor them. We transplant these cells through different routes into the body. What they do in science and in research is they tag the cell. So if you tag the cell, you have a little marker sitting on the cell, which is a radionuclear tag, so that when that cell moves in your system, you can tag him and see what's happening. What has that cell to do? That cell has to go to the orphans. It has to differentiate into the, the brain cell that you want. Let's say that we are looking for brain cells. So out of every cell, and in the brain itself, there may be about 10 to 15 or 100 different types of cells which are there. So which one are you looking at? The myelin cell, at the glial cell, at the astrocyte, at the different types of cells? Which one is it you want for your disease? Okay, so one, if you've tagged, you'll see what percentage of your cells of the 2 million or 10 million that are injected into you actually go and become a brain cell. Then it reaches the brain, it has to go to the site that you want it to go to. So if I'm Parkinson's, I want it to go only to the basal ganglia in the globus pili, that's the area where dopamine is made. So does it actually go and sit over there? Once it sits there, it has to make a connection. It's like a telephone call. It has to start growing in that area, and then he has to make a telephone to the cell next to him. They both have to connect, and the conversation has to start. So if he grows and the connection isn't there, there's no conversation. That cell will just be sitting over there doing something but not connecting and making circuits. So not only does he go in, he has to multiply, he has to become the cell you want, he has to find the place in the brain or the organ you want him to go to, he has to make sprout different dendrites, he has to make connections, make the phone call, and the call should connect for circuitry to start building between them. Not easy, and down the line, we don't know the total lifespan of these cells. We don't know the reproductive capabilities. Some of them have longer, some of them have milder. And obviously the fear of the teratogenic potential, which is not going to happen today and tomorrow, is going to happen years down the line. We don't know what happens over there. And the ultimate state of it is how to look at it is obviously to do a biopsy and then see where the cell is and what's happening there. So worldwide policies, these are countries, this is really for embryonic stem cell. With the advent of induced pluripotent stem cell, all of this is really not so necessary, but these are countries that allow it. These are countries that are not so keen on it, a country which is divided in its opinion on it and which has no policy, which was Mexico. Cloning, which is a totally different thing, it means producing an entire human being out of the first cell, is totally banned worldwide, anywhere else. But these are the countries which are officially allowing research in stem cell, with embryonic stem cell. With pluripotent, it makes it much easier. Indian policies, we have guidelines by the biomedical research of human participation, Indian Council of Medical Research, which it says that stem cells can be used for research purposes, for conditions which do not have allopathic treatment on compassionate grounds, but the emphasis is that it's on a research purpose. And recognized centers, every country has centers which are recognized, which holds stem cells or has stem cell banks. We know the Tata Institute has been doing it for years. A bone marrow transplant, children who have leukemias, what do we do? We give them a transplant. That is stem, that's the whole thing is stem cell. We clean out their cells, we inject clean stem cells into them, let them multiply, and the child is, moves on into life with a whole new set of cells which do not have the damaged things that he has. Okay, so it is used in conditions. There's a big want in it for cardiac is gonna come, diabetes is gonna come, joints is gonna come, so there's a lot of potential. Retina is very well used. LV Prasad is doing some fantastic work on retinal problems for, with, uh, with stem cells. The neurological conditions that stem cell has been tried on and researched. For want of time, I cannot go through each of these conditions, but these are all the conditions that we have tried or research is ongoing at the moment for stem cells. Some or most of them, unfortunately, have not proved to be beneficial in the humans as well as it is happening in labs. For some reason, they work well in labs. You're getting good results in the Petri dish in the laboratory, but when you're trying it on the human race, it is not working the way we want to. So what's happening in the body and outside the body and what's happening in the body is not totally reproducible, though we are trying with science. 
The one entity I want to highlight, because maybe the most detailed and well-studied research for this has come out of Parkinson's disease. There was a study which came out of Europe. It was a multicentric study. Top-end universities, Queen's Square in London, Karolinska in Sweden, uh, somewhere in France, all the top neuroscientific uh, centers in Europe did this multicentric study where they took patients with Parkinson's at a certain grade, et cetera, and they injected fetal stem cells into their brains in that particular region. Unfortunately, each center had its own lab. And each center was doing its own culturing. Some put 50,000, some put 100,000, some put differentiated cells, some put pure fetal cells. So it was not totally uniform. The results were good. Six months were happy. One year was happy. <coughs> At the end of the one year before the thing, the US came out with a study which was similar. But they did it not, they did it as a controlled study. They did patients who didn't get the stem cells and they did patients who got the stem cell, which is really how research should be done. Double blind, you don't know if you're gonna be the one to receive it or not. You think you're going to get it. We have something called a placebo effect in science. You think you're gonna get the stem cell. You're not told whether you are the one who gets it or not. They actually had the procedure, the needle put in everything. They all thought they were getting the stem cells. <coughs> and what did they see? Six months later, those on the therapy did a little better. One year later, the difference was still there, the improvement, but not so much. But two years down the line, they found that they had a whole load of complications that the ones who didn't have stem cell had. What were the complications? There was overproduction of the dopamine. We were putting dopamine cells into the brain to produce dopamine so that you combat the deficiency which is naturally there in the body. And what happens? The cells kept dividing and dividing and dividing, eventually producing so much dopamine that you got the complications of dopamine. So they all got dyskinesias and movement disorders and a whole spectrum, and their quality of life was actually worse off than those who were not on the study. And at the end of the day, it was put down that it's not a treatment, it's not recommended. Maybe the dose was too much, maybe the dose should be less, maybe the way of giving it has to be different. We don't know yet what's the ideal dose, what's the concentration, where's the best place to put, should we differentiate or not differentiate? You get it? So at the end of the day, it was a research project done very well scientifically, but it proved it didn't benefit because we are still not in control of how to handle these cells. They have a fantastic potential, but we are not yet there where you can use them over the counter for conditions down the line. So in conclusion, stem cells have the ability to divide limitlessly, lifelong, and into any cell type. They are within us all. Where do we find stem cells? Everybody has stem cells sitting in the organ, <coughs> in the center of their organ. So if you want bone marrow, you'll get them in your, if you want bone blood ones, you'll get them in your bone marrow. If you want brain ones, they sit on the lining of the ventricles of the brain. If you want eye ones, they'll be sitting at the center in the eye. So at the core of your organ, you will have your own stem cells sitting, multiplying and helping you grow and regenerate as we go. They are working nonstop to help us repair our body as it is. They're all there sitting, waiting and helping you. Okay, they can be created artificially as embryonic adult or induced stem cells. While they have a great potential, they are not without their limited side effects. And it has given us, the science of stem cell has given us tremendous hope that few years, I don't know where that few is, whether it's few or more than few, we will actually have a better understanding of the diseases we treat and likewise a treatment option for them. Thank you. So what is special about stem cells? Anaita has covered that, but I'm just going to run through shortly is the ability to divide, uh, to multiply, and the ability to convert into other cells. And uh, this is a picture from our own research. Uh, this is when we take out cells from the bone marrow. They look like that, mononuclear cells. And these, we cultured them outside. This is apart from a clinical work. And when we grew them, uh, this at the end of six weeks, you can see what they've converted into. So these are cells which are neuron-like cells, but most important is they are converting. So this is what we took out. And at the end of six weeks, this is what we, we saw outside when we replicated the internal environment outside. Uh, what we found most fascinating was not just that these were converting into these cells, but they were communicating. All these cells that had been created were talking to each other. Uh, the other part, important thing, and especially for autism, is that they release positive chemicals. And the main thing, one of the things that we have found uh, are nerve growth factors, in particular BDNF. 
They improve the blood supply. And again, this is important because they are in, in autism, we have found there are areas that are hypermetabolic. That means they aren't perfused as well. So what exactly is stem cell therapy? Basically, stem cell therapy is something very different, uh, simple. We use healthy cells to replace damaged cells. That's what it's about. So there is a damage. You take cells and you replace it. Up to now, before cellular therapy, all we had were either drugs and injections. You had tablets, injections, or we had surgery. We went chopped, cut, lopped. But now we have a new opportunity, the use of cells, the use of something that's living, the use of something that naturally heals the body. And, uh, and so this is the, the basic fundamental of stem cell therapy, to use healthy cells to replace damaged cells. So if, you know, this is what we've been seeing a lot in autism. This is a child of autism. And when you have stem cells and you put them inside, there you can see a significant diminishing in that. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about it. Uh, there are different types of stem cells. Uh, Anaita has spoken in detail. But I wish to emphasize this is really very important because all the problems, the cons, the controversies, the ethical issues, the side effects, the risks, all of them come from embryonic stem cells, all right? But unfortunately, because the others are called stem cells, it has been put together. You know, everything has been lumped together. Uh, so uh, embryonic stem cells, yes, they may be the most potent, but they're also the most dangerous because they can convert into tumors called teratomas. And, uh, they, they have, and you know, we don't know what happens when you put them inside. However, adult stem cells, which we take from the own body, and which is what we use, have none of those side effects. They are completely different. They are from your own body. And all the confusion, everything that uh, the controversy in stem cell, because people do not distinguish different types of stem cells, and that the risks and benefits of one may not necessarily be the risks and benefits of both. So uh, Anaita has spoken about it, so I won't go into details. But according to me, yes, uh, embryonic stem cells are dangerous. But adult stem cells, we can give them a go ahead. And comparing these two, according to me, is like comparing alcohol and homemade orange juice, and saying both are beverages, so both are dangerous. OK, alcohol is dangerous. It's a beverage. But can you say homemade orange juice is dangerous? Embryonic stem cells, my friends, are like alcohol. They are powerful, but they are dangerous. Adult stem cells, which I'm going to talk about, are like homemade orange juice. We are taking from your own body, putting it back into your own body without doing anything to it. How can it harm you? We are assisting the natural healing system. So I want you to remember that when you ever listen to a controversy or a problem with stem cells, Ask yourself, we are talking about alcohol or homemade orange juice, OK? So I want you to remember this picture, because that will separate everything. Now, is there a scientific, you know, I, this whole presentation is in question. So the question is on top. So is there a scientific base for its use? Because sometimes people question that. Of course there is, because the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 2012 went to stem cell research. And in 1990 and 2007, no other topic in medicine, we all know the Nobel Prize is the most prestigious award that's given. Never in 20 years has the same topic got three Nobel Prizes. So obviously, there's a very solid scientific base for stem cell therapy. But then why are they controversial? The whole controversy is because way back in 2001, President George Bush had banned the federal funding of embryonic stem cells. I repeat, embryonic stem cells. Uh, the, the reason had nothing to do with science or patients. It had got to do with politics and religion. Uh, because the Roman Catholic Church believes that fetuses should not be used, and they believe that embryos should not be used. And that is why its federal funding was banned. But this ban was for embryonic, not adult. But most important, in 2009, President Obama, on his first day of work, lifted that ban. That ban is no more valid in America anymore. Uh. So what is the global scenario? The global scenario is changing dramatically. Things are moving so fast that it's unbelievable. I'm writing a, I've, I've written two papers on, on regulations. And before I could send it, something new comes up. For example, Japan has offered fast track approval paths for stem cell therapy. So Japan and Korea have shown the lead. These two countries and the government of India is actually studying the Japanese and Korean system and implementing them in India. And this is really good news for us. So what the Japanese have done, they've said that if in a pilot study of 10 patients, you can show significant improvement or in 100 patients, less marginal improvement, they said you have permission to use it, to market it. But most important, they've said insurance has to pay for it. So the Japanese are showing us the way, and the Americans are now following. And the government of India is actually studying this. In Korea, they have made a distinction between uh, allogenic and autologous. And they have said that if a medical doctor performs minimal manipulation, which does not cause this, and this is what we do, they said you're outside the regulation. You're free. Today, the regulators are making a distinction between a procedure 
and a product. All right, a product is something companies sell. A procedure is something doctors do. So when I take out bone marrow, I culture the cells and put it back, it's a procedure. And today, the government is saying, that's a procedure, you do it as per your norms, but a product, when you sell it, has to be uh, under control. Now, most important, the Bible of medicine. A Bible of medicine is something called Harrison's textbook of medicine. In that, there is a section on stem cell therapy, but most important, they've included the newer indications in applications, including Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So Harrison is now, which is a Bible, is now actually introduced the concept of stem cell therapy as a separate chapter. Now, the, in, in, in India, we have the ICMR, which was, which was in charge, and now this has been taken over by the DCGI. They had three sets of regulations. Uh, the earlier ones were progressive, the later ones were, were sort of self-contradictory, but now, the DCGI has taken over. There is a new law which says that the government of India through DCGI will regulate all practices, therapeutic. So it is making a distinction between therapy and research. And the Drug Controller General of India, who is the most powerful regulator, you, no drug, no implant, no medical instrument can come in the country without approval of the Drug Controller General of India. And the Drug Controller General now controls stem cell therapy, not ICMR, because they have made new rules. So ICMR will control research, but therapy will be now with DCGI. And this is the Drug Controller General of India, uh, Mr. G. N. Singh, who was with us just last month. Uh, there's a journal we have called the Indian Journal of Stem Cell Therapy, and that shows the science. There's now a journal on stem cell therapy. That is how much it is advanced. And uh, the Drug Controller General of India, that's with me, and he's with Dr. Nandani, who's sitting here, who's the uh, founding uh, editor-in-chief of the journal. And he released the journal, and he was very supportive. So things have changed. Today, the government of India is actually asking us for help, is asking us to make guidelines that are more patient-friendly. They are listening to patients. They are listening to the practicing doctors. So the entire scenario is changing. This is to, I'm, I'm talking in detail, so to let go of the myths. There's so many myths. There's so many falsehoods in people's heads. And we have to let go of that. The most powerful man in the country for regulator, the Drug Controller General of India, was with us, released our journal, and assured us publicly in the meeting that we will promote and propagate stem cell therapy, okay, especially autologous. He said we'll take autologous out of the regulations. The most important thing, what are the views of the government of India? Our prime minister, he's actually our biggest supporter. When he went to Japan, he actually spent two hours with Professor Yamanaka. Now, how many prime ministers would visit a stem cell institute? He went to Kyoto, spent two hours with him, later on, uh, and discussed a lot of stem cell therapy with him. Just recently, in February 2015, he went to Bangalore. Again, he visited the Stem Cell Institute and gave a very motivating speech to the students, saying you must focus on stem cell research. You must uh, you know, develop this science. And uh, this, this is a little funny, so listen to it. जन्म की सारी जो कथा आती है वो शरीर पर से एक छोटा सा हिस्सा लिया और उसी वजह से कारण पैदा हुए और स्टेम सेल वाले यही करते हैं मैं डॉक्टरों का गुड इवनिंग एवरीवन एंड आई कम फ्रॉम द एस शशि तरुर सेड द हेनरी द एथ स्कूल ऑफ टॉक्स वे ही सेड टू हिज वाइफ्स आई वोंट कीप यू लॉन्ग सो आई एम � one of my precious seven minutes by s thanking Forum for Autism Awareness and saying it is uh, such a privilege to be associated with you all. And I see today as not just a discussion on stem cell therapy. Uh, in fact, if it was only on stem cell therapy, I shouldn't be here, really. I know, know very little about it. Um, but I see it as part of a movement, a part of a movement for parents of children with disability in this country to become informed consumers, to become empowered and knowledgeable enough to be empowered to make the right decision. So I really do believe that it's a very, very important occasion, that you need to make decisions for your child and feel like you have the ability and the knowledge to make the right decisions. We are only here to give you our knowledge, to share with you, and I'm very, very confident that every parent here is smart enough, is critical enough, is balanced enough to make the right decision for their child. So I began with this quote, where there is no cure, there are a thousand treatments, okay? And I believe what President Obama was trying to say is that 
there is no cure for autism yet. And I think the word yet is important um, because we, there is always hope. There is a reason why our not-for-profit is called Umid, uh, and because I believe there is always hope. But we have to be practical and say that as of now, no cure exists for autism. Let's put it out there, okay? Knowing that, we know that when there is no cure, there are lots of people offering treatments, and we need to be aware of which treatment to choose for children. So what I'm going to present to you, like I said, मुझे stem cell therapy के बारे में बहुत कुछ नहीं पता है, लेकिन मुझे autism के बारे में काफी कुछ पता है। तो I will try to share with you how to make a decision for your child if your child has autism. Okay. So सबसे पहली बात तो ये है कि is there any evidence? क्या इसके लिए कोई सबूत है? Do we have proof that it works? Right? So some of these words you heard in the course of this conversation, randomized control trial. Kya hai ye cheez? What is this randomized control trial? I'll try to simplify it for you. A group of children with autism who are very similar to each other. Two groups, group A and group B. They are both kids with autism, but they are very similar, right? What does that mean? Unka age ek hai, dono group mein age is similar hai, dono group mein language levels similar hai, dono group mein interventions, therapy interventions similar hai. Jitna bhi hum dono ko match kar sake, unko match karte hai. Phir, researcher kya karta hai ki randomly, right? In do groups ko randomly select karta hai. Pura group hai, aur un dono ko randomly, yane ki bina kisi plan ke, a method is that how do you randomize and you put children into the different groups, okay, out of a bigger group so that they are matched. So you can't do it in a way that I know which group is going to get the intervention and which group is not. And I say, let me put this kid with a little better language and parents who are a little more savvy in the intervention group and see what happens. You're not allowed to do that, right? So it's a randomized control trial. And then what we do is one group gets the intervention and one group does not and often gets something that's very similar. So for example, the placebo that, we were t that Dr. Sharma was talking about very often is a drug. So if you're doing a drug trial, you would give a medicine to one, to one group of kids, the true medicine that you're trying out to see if it works and to the other group you would be giving a similar looking pill similar looking similar tasting pill so they can't figure out who's getting the intervention and who is not right and at the end of it what happens at the end of it is the people who assess did it work or did it not don't know which group the child belonged to Right? I am a researcher. Rajesh has done the you know, randomized control trial. He knows who's in which group. But I come and look and see who, how, which one of these kids has made progress. Right? So I have a group of researchers who at the beginning assessed all the kids. They come at the end and assess all the kids. And we say, is there a bigger difference in the group that received the drug? Or is there you know, no difference between the group that received the drug and who didn't? Right? So that's a randomized control trial, and today that's considered the standard. कि जब तक किसी भी treatment condition का ये randomized control trial के जरिए हमारे पास सबूत नहीं है कि ये काम करता है, तो उसको हम अपनाते नहीं हैं scientifically. Having said that. As Dr. Sharma said, there are many conditions where you say कि हम तब तक wait नहीं कर सकते जब तक randomized control trial है, so we will you know do this on an experimental basis or whatever it is. The second thing you have to look at when you're looking at a research study, जब आप research के बारे में सुन रहे हैं कि किसने ये fund किया है? Supposing I'm a drug company making the drug and I fund this research, right? No prizes for guessing what that research is going to show, right? So it's important to say कि इसका funding source कहाँ है? ये जो peer reviewed journal की हम बात कर रहे हैं, a peer reviewed journal is one where it's impartial, where your peers, if I submit a paper, 
people like you know Dr. Sharma, Anaita, Rajesh will look at the paper and they don't know who submitted it. They won't say, Are, it's my friend, I'll take that paper, right? They don't do that. They look at things like who has funded it, have they got permission from the ethics committee? They look at things and then they look at the quality of research. <laughs> has it been done well? So there are certain peer-reviewed journals that doctors are aware of that, you know, if it's published, having said that, even peer-reviewed journals have made mistakes. They have withdrawn trials, the famous MMR trial, I don't know if you've heard of it, that the measles, mumps and rubella vaccine causes uh, autism. There was a big buzz around that and that was later withdrawn by a peer-reviewed journal because they found faults in the way it had been done. Is it relevant for your child? In the sense that if this is a study, for example, done in the US, where all kids get a certain type of therapy anyway, the school system gives you interventions, the medical system gives you interventions, and then you have your intervention over there, that's a different matter, right? I know a lot of parents, I trained in the US, I know a lot of parents in the US used to give their kids Epsom salts and this and that, but the school system was also supporting them, the healthcare system was providing them therapies. So they had a background of a lot of things available to them. So you have to see in our context, is it relevant? And lastly, and I will let Rajesh talk more about this, does the science behind the treatment match the science behind the condition? Or rather, what do I understand of the condition today, right? If I know it's a heart condition, or if I know it's a brain condition, you tell me, ye ek aisa drug hai jo aapke liver ko bahut help karega. Well, I know this is not a liver condition, it's a heart condition. Or for example, I know that, you know, um, lack of dopamine helps, uh, you know, causes this particular condition. And I'm giving a treatment that increases the cell that produce dopamine, great. But unfortunately, in autism, we're not sure what is the etiology of autism. We don't know really what happens, other than the fact that it's genetic. We know that there is a strong tendency for it to be genetically linked. We do not know a lot about which cells, which neurochemicals. We don't know much about autism as far as that is concerned. So there are still unanswered questions. So it's hard to find a target in autism. Right? There are already hundreds of candidate genes, even though we know it's a genetic condition. So leave alone knowing exactly where in the brain the pathology is. Thank you very much. It's really very privilege, big great privilege for me to speak to people, many of them I've seen over the years. And I've been in this field for the last 25 years. And I must admit that we've tried a lot of unproven therapy. But what is important is that even though you may have tried it, you must know whether they are safe, whether there is any evidence that they are efficacious, and most importantly, they should not be heavy on your wallet, make you forget about the therapies which are the most important and proven therapies in autism, all the different therapies. And therefore, I'll just give you a basic idea of how we evaluate treatments in the context of autism, which is a very peculiar disorder. All of us want this, parents, patients, doctors. And you want treatment, I, I must, um, um, Parul talked about how we are ex making guinea pigs of, pati of our patients, which is going to happen. But it has to happen only with your consent. So you want efficacy and safety. And like I said, if you give a treatment and it works, Dr. Sharma showed us some patients where the treatment was given, stem cells, and the patient started doing this, that, the other. The problem is, it's not so simple. It's very much more complicated. And the first thing we talk about is the natural history of the disease. What happens to patients if no treatment is given? Can it still improve? Can it still get cured? And I'll talk about this in a little bit later, the next slide. The second, of course, the problem of the placebo effect, which I will talk about again. So what about natural history? If you look at all 
all disease in general, about 70% of human illness gets better on its own or improves. Classic example, you have children who have infections, you go to the doctor, use antibiotics, it gets better, you know it's a virus, which you didn't require antibiotics. What is a placebo effect? What appears to be a real treatment to the patient or the parent. Intervention when it really isn't and may improve symptoms some of the time. At least that's what's called the power of the mind. Now Dr. Sharma very eloquently said, how can a placebo effect be seen in children with autism who can't speak or who are not communicative enough? And the answer to that is the way we test these children is through their parents, unfortunately. We have to ask questions like clinical global impression scale, autism treatment evaluation checklists, everything is to the parent. And the parent wants the child to get better. Whatever new you use gets better. We want to do that. I'll give you an example. We have used steroids in autism many years ago when there was some literature that these patients improve with steroids and there is a lot of immune dysfunction. And we all had patients who said they've improved. So we did a study. We did a blinded study. We did an evaluation on videos by a therapist and by an autism expert who did not know whether the child had been given steroids or not. Unfortunately, it didn't work, so I stopped it. In the same way, when you say placebo effect doesn't occur in parents, oh no, 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 that's absolutely untrue. Because you're evaluating the patient through parents and not through the child alone. Then bias. What is bias? It's something which makes you believe what may not be. So for example, let's take a simple example of selection bias. So as uh, Vibhaya said, you select a patient, and if you select it unconsciously, you take a patient who's going to be given treatment is a milder patient. And the patient who's not going to be given treatment is a more severe patient. Obviously, there'll be a problem, no? The patient who's given the treatment will improve. So these kind of things are called bias, and the bias is not only in the parents, it's also in the researcher, it's also in the evaluator. And all these are important things to understand when a treatment is actually tested. And finally, multiple therapies. Who stops therapy when you give some treatment? You are continuing the therapies, you are doing also, therefore, you don't know whether what is really working. Suppose I give a patient stem cells. What is the timeline for improvement? If I give a patient therapy, what is the timeline for improvement? I don't know that. So the problem is always, and this is not something you can solve in a, in a, in a, in a, in a place like this. These are the problems faced by all autism researchers. Also remember, autism is an up and down disease. There are times when the behavior is terrible, when the time when the behavior is much better, we know there's a mood swing, symptoms increase, decrease. Depends on when you evaluate them. If they go one day and the, and the CAR score is 45 and the other day the CAR score is 35. If you do CAR score with one, one therapist, it comes 45, the other one is 35. So this is all subjective, it's very difficult, very difficult to actually put numbers. Now the second thing Kasharma said is very interesting, the PET scan and damage. Unfortunately in autism there is no damage. If you look at pathology of autistic brains, you don't find, I'm talking of idiopathic autism, I'm talking of the autism most people have, most kids have. There is no damage. So what is your stem cell doing? How is it increasing that metabolism and increasing the perfusion? How is it regenerating when there is no damage at all? It is not like, you know, perinatal brain injury, brain injury at birth where you have some cerebral palsy kind of thing, where you can even conceptualize and maybe stem cells go and make those neurons grow and stuff like that. Over here, there is no damage. Let's look at 
Okay, I just, hence the clinical trial, I will just talk about this and therefore the rationale is most important. I don't want to go through all the uh, things that Vibha has already gone through, double blind, randomized, etc. And so I'll leave that. The only thing I want to talk about here is the number of subjects. The larger the number of subjects, the better the trial. The smaller the number of subjects, very often erroneous results. And remember, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a party to this. I'm sure Parul must have been looking at me that you have tried so many treatments in your patients. And it's true, I have tried and I admit to that. Because I believe that besides therapy, there should be other treatments if they are available, but never compromise on therapy and never use anything which is not safe. So for example, secretin. There was a study, many studies, secretin helps. So we gave it to seven children. And I thought to myself, there is some improvement. And then a large trial was done, double time randomized, zero effect. Secretin went by the wayside. So what underlies autism is important to know how therapies will work. Just to make you understand, the brain works on networks. And there are short networks and there are long networks. So for example, let's take language. You have to hear something, understand it, which comes from the back of the brain on the left side. That information has to be transmitted to the front of the brain where you have to formulate the words. From there it goes to the motor areas which finally brings out the speech. So this is a long distance network, lots of relay stations. Similar, look at this. This is how we recognize emotions. So this area of the brain, which is marked out, this detects the gaze of a person when he talks to you. Another area perceives the face and recognizes it. So the first part just detects the gaze, the second part recognizes who this person is. The third part, third part is in the front, has facial expression. What is a facial expression? Is he angry? Is he sad? Is he unhappy? Whatever. So you come to some sort of mentalizing. What does the patient or what is the person thinking? And finally, react. And in autism, what has been clearly found, without any doubt, is that these long distance connections are poor. There is under connectivity. And the only thing which I can think of which can improve connectivity is training. So you give therapy and you give therapy and you give therapy and those connections will be made. And those connections will be made in the first five to six to seven years. They will not be made after that. So therapy in the beginning is what works. And we always tell them 18, 15, 18 hours a week, therapy should be given. That is the primary treatment of autism because it's the only thing which makes sense. How do you improve networking otherwise? This is just an example. These are four faces. This is an example of how the autistic brain uh, reacts to fearful facial expression and how the non-autistic brain. So this is a non-autistic brain. These are four different faces of fear. This is mild, this is severe. This patient's amygdala is activated and these are, these are control brains, but this is autism where it's absent. Telling you the long distance connectivity is poor. We know it's a genetic disorder. We have twins, 90% concordance, increased risk in SIPs, lots of genes. Difficult to understand what these genetic mutations are, but we know they are there. So autism is a disorder which occurs before birth. And many of those genes are important for connectivity. And if you don't have those genes, if they're mutated, you don't have the connections. That's why you have this tendency to autism. There are some environmental factors, very widely debated. Nobody knows whether food allergy, immune changes, as Dr. Sharma talked about, all these really have an effect. I mean, steroids are anti-inflammatory, one of the most potent anti-inflammatory medications didn't make a damn difference. So nobody is sure. So problems of stem cell in therapy in autism. Most Indian centers use own 
bone marrow derived stem cell. I'm not sure what Sharma uses, but I'm assuming he uses from the, from the patient himself. So we presume that the stem cells in the patient have the same genetic defect as the stem cells, uh, as the patient has in autism. So I don't understand genetically it can't work. It may be working if it is working by some other mechanism. But genetically, it is impossible for it to work. Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Duchenne muscular dystrophy is a known uh, genetic defect. We know which protein is absent. By giving him bone marrow stem cells into the patient, what are you doing? It doesn't make sense. The All India Institute of Medical Sciences started a study in DNP with stem cells, had to abandon it because of the same objection from the ethics pool committee. No brain damage I already mentioned. And finally, environmental factors we don't really know about. I just wanted to take one of the uh, uh, papers which uh, had controls. So there were three papers I found, one was Rav Sharma's paper. These were all open trials. This particular paper came from China. It was published in Journal of Translational Medicine. There were two treatment groups and one control group. But look at the number of patients, 14 patients in the treatment each, and nine controls, very small numbers. Secondly, they used stem cells from donor umbilical cord cells, not the patient's own cells. And they found improvement. Like most of, most papers will report improvements. Remember, that's called publication bias. I did not report the steroid negative effect. It didn't work. What the hell? What's the point of publishing it? So you publish something when it works. You don't publish something when it doesn't work. And therefore, all these three papers had improvement. Authors themselves admit, not randomized, so selection bias, not blinded, not blinded by the people who were doing the assessments. So they knew who was given treatment, who was not given treatment. Small numbers, and they only recommend large scale randomized controlled double blind studies and these are on three large trials are recruiting patients in the US and Mexico and these are all double blind randomized controlled wait for those results if the results are good go ahead you'll know exactly which cell to use how much dose to use how often to use it whether to give it intravenously intrathecally etc 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 this is my last uh, uh, you know, this is a uh, very famous researcher who wrote this, who did this study and wrote this paper on stem cell clinics. It's an old paper, it's 2007, the direct to consumer portrayal of stem cell medicine. It has become a marketing thing. I want to market a treatment, say a drug, it goes through the pharma company, it goes through the FDA, it goes through all sorts of, while stem cells goes directly to the consumer. So they actually looked at 19 websites and the treatments for all ailments were available. Brain ailments, heart ailments, and even allergies. Published evidence for all neurological conditions like autism, Alzheimer's in those days, low grade evidence. So finally, the conclusion is patients should be wary of claims made by stem cell clinics on the internet. The direct-to-consumer portrayal of stem cell medicine is over-optimistic given the peer-reviewed literature. More research is needed. So I think what I'm going to tell you, the final thing. I think as a forum for autism, as a parent organization, we should do research in conditions like giving treatments like stem cells. Because that is the only way forward. Large numbers, we have large numbers of autism. Mm -hmm. If you people give informed consent, and if everything is funded, so you don't have to pay a single paisa from your pocket, then you can have controls, you can have patients, you can have stratification of what type and everything, and come to a reasonable conclusion, add to the American, and then add to the medical literature, and if stem cells is effective, I'm the first one for it. I've tried everything else, why not stem cells? But, try it only if it is not high in your wallet, and it's definitely safe. We don't know that as yet. 
And I would not definitely do it till these two factors are met. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Ta Ta Tatiana Dias, and um, I'd like to tell you a little story. It's a personal story. So uh, the 9th of July, 1988, was the best day of my life. My parents gave me the best gift ever. I had a little baby sister. I have so many, many pictures of my sister. Uh, you know, when she was very small, she was just born in hospital. And it was fantastic. I felt that sense of, oh my god, I can be you know, the best sister to this sister of mine. Uh, never wanted a brother. Uh, but, you know, it was, it was an absolutely amazing moment. As the years went by, there was something, something a bit wrong. You know, I knew that she wasn't well. My parents were going to one doctor after the next, after the next. She was actually born a normal child, and she had an infection. She had, um, she, she basically had about 90% brain damage. When she was eight years old in a school called Jaivakil, which many of you all would know here today, she was, uh, they told us that she had autism. She was eight at the time, and autism had just about arrived in India. We didn't know what it was. We didn't know, you know, how exactly to really help her. You know, she had, um, she basically had fits. She had mood swings. It was difficult to control her behavior. So, you know, as, as, a, as a family member, as a, as a p person who has experienced autism, you know, firsthand, I can feel your angst. I can feel your pain. You know, the number of nights that my family has sat up because my sister has not been able to sleep, the number of years that my, you know, my parents have, uh, have basically stayed awake and have had to go to work the next day, you know, going to one, one place to the other to the other. In fact, all the three doctors here were my sister's doctors. And unfortunately, my sister passed away two months ago. She was 26 years old. And I can tell you that it has been the most difficult two months of our life because she made us complete. She made us whole. She was the inspiration for me to take up research in the first place. I was very interested when I was a child in Star Trek. And my mother always used to tell me, come and help me in the kitchen. I was like, no way, I'm cutting those onions for you. I was more interested in you know, what was happening you know, with, uh, with, with, with with how we could actually find out, you know, about something through research, through science. And I did my BSc from uh, Xavier's College in Mumbai, um, in now in 2005. Uh, and from there, I went to the UK, and I, I basically did my master's, my PhD. And I basically ended up in doing my postdoc at the University of Cambridge where I was working on the most cutting edge technology that we have today in human disease, which is the use of these induced pluripotent stem cells that Dr. An Anaita gave a very good introduction to. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what, we are, what I have done in the lab, what we are actually aiming to do with this kind of research. And I will finish off by telling you why we never opted for stem cell treatments, even though my sister had autism. So that you go away today, like, doc doctor, um, like the doctors have already pointed out, that you need to make an informed choice for yourself. You need to go out here feeling empowered that you know what you're actually g getting into okay, by having all the facts in front of you. So the current stance in the scientific field at the moment is that stem cells are being used as a research tool only. The ban that Obama lifted was for research, so that people like me, people like the people I work with, and people I, people I work for, can use stem cells to model diseases to see what is actually going wrong. And one of the biggest concerns that we have today with autism is the fact that we really don't know what is happening. There are several different impl implications for the disease, but we don't know, Are that is really it. So we really need to know more about it. And using induced pluripotent stem cells is one way that we have got around this. It has given us this potential to research a lot more into what exactly is happening. So 
In the lab, we are very interested in two different aspects. The first is brain development, and the other is what goes wrong when there's something that happens in the brain such that you cannot actually function as what we call normally. I should also state that all your kids, including my sister, have very, very special talents. In fact, they are differently abled. They are not, in the right words, special. Okay, they are differently abled. All of us are differently abled. So one of the main areas in the brain that is actually affected is this cortex. Now the cortex is this wrinkly surface that you can see in the scan okay, of, of, uh, of um, a patient. Now this wrinkly cortex is what makes up your thoughts, your emotions, and, and controls your very being. Okay? Now the work in the brain though is done at the level of individual cells and each one of us here has about a hundred billion neurons that communicate with each other. What is very important to remember in terms of stem cell treatment as well is the fact that these neurons are highly complex structures. They're highly complex cells. They have these branches, they look like little trees and they use these branches to talk to other neurons in their, in their area to say, hey, you know, are you my friend? Or, you know, if you're not my friend, then, you know, I'm going to go and talk to someone else. So they're very, very special cells. And it is also very complicated. Brain development is one of the most complex things that we are actually trying to tackle today. Now, these stem cells in the lab typically grow like this, like a, a little, like, like a ball of cells, okay? And once we have these stem cells, like I was saying, we can then convert them to anything we want. Now, we convert them to neural stem cells. And they're actually very, very pretty in culture. They look like flowers. And over a period of 90 days, we wait till we basically make these neurons called, uh, uh, ne these neurons from the cortex. Now, we need to wait for 90 days because the brain is a layered structure. There are six different layers, so we need to wait till we have layers one to six. And so it used to take us almost three months to do one experiment. So in a way, it is a great technology and it has lots of promise. And also what is reassuring is that it does take that much time to actually see these cells in culture. If it was that quick, you know, we would be like, Are, how can we use this, you know, to look at anything? So this is what we do in the lab every, every single day. Now, once we have these neurons here, and this is what they look like. So they are basically these long structures. So in, in blue is basically the, the actual bo body of the cell. And in green are their branches. So we make several of these neurons and we can tag them with different colors to look at them, to look at how they actually look in culture. What is also very interesting is that over time, if you follow these cells in culture, one defining feature is that these are electrical cells and they communicate with each other. So we are actually looking to see whether these neurons are communicating properly. And we use a technique called called um, uh, im, uh, ca calcium imaging, wherein the calcium influx that goes in and out of the cells is what we are tracking. So they look like lights on a Christmas tree. I don't know if you guys can see it at the back, but basically they are flashing lights. And over a span of 90 days, you can see these flashing lights among these neurons. And what's very interesting is that these flashing lights also change over time in culture, which means that these circuits are being made and broken because neurons are trying to find their partners, trying to find their connections, trying to find their friends. So one of the things that we, we do in the lab is we look, like I said, at what happens in diseases that affect the brain. And we are very interested in the UK because unlike India, the UK has an aging population. It's great to see a lot of young people here. Um, that dementia is one of the biggest things that is facing the, the, uh, facing the UK government and staring it in the eye. And nobody knows what exactly to do. So one of the ways we are trying to tackle this is actually using a, a very close sort of uh, a disease that is close to autism as well in a neurodevelopmental context is Down syndrome. Because what's very interesting about Down syndrome is that patients who are 50 years and above have a very high risk of getting dementia. So we are using these, these uh, skin cells from these patients with Downs to look at exactly what is happening not only in Down syndrome but also in dementia. 
One of the things that we have found with respect to Down syndrome is that these connections, this, these lights on the Christmas tree, that is what is defected. We find that there are also less numbers of cells in a culture with Down syndrome. So the potential of, of using induced pluripotent cells is really to, to look at it as a research tool is for us to try and understand what exactly is happening in the um, disease as such, and not as a treatment option at all. So in the lab, what we are doing is we are using these human neurons to study the condition in real time, because these are from the patients. They have the same genetic makeup. It has got tremendous potential for, for healthcare in general. And then we are using this as a drug discovery platform to see whether there are any drugs that we can actually use to find out if there are any novel drugs that we can use to treat these different diseases. Now, we in the lab are not actively working on autism, but our colleagues around the world have been, you have been using this technique of induced pluripotent stem cells to look at autism. And I wanted to highlight that for you today. So, like I was saying, there are almost 500 different genetic uh, variants of autism. And each one increases the risk of getting autism only by a tiny bit. We really don't know what the trigger is in autism. Okay? Anybody's guess could be that, you know, the person has uh, basically, you know, is very in their, is, their, is in their own world. They have, you know, pr problems in speaking. And, and a, a whole array of different things, you know, mood disorders, sleep. Now, the, different, the, the work that has been done to, to look at autism using uh, cells from patients have been looking at two different forms. One is the genetic forms of autism. There is a condition called Rett syndrome, wherein by using this technique, they have been able to find that there are actually shorter branches. So basically, because there are shorter branches, there are communication problems between the neurons. But this, this work needs to be done again and again and again in several different labs for us to say for certain that this is what is really the case in RETS. We don't know that yet. And it is not clear from post-mortem samples as well from patients with RETS that this is what is really happening. The other... Uh, um, the other uh, uh, work that was done was using another con condition which has a genetic basis to it is, uh, um, is basically where they have also found communication defects, where you can actually see that these flashing lights are causing, causing these neurons to not actually act together, act in concert. Okay? Now, there is, besides all of these, there is what is called idiopathic autism, for which there is no genetic link whatsoever. And scientists have just been able to do that last year, where they have taken cells from patients with no genetic cause, no, no sort of you know, change at the, at the genome level, and have found that there have been shorter branches, and that there are fewer connections, and so again, there are communication defects. Now, scientists are trying to put these things together. They're trying to piecemeal all these different aspects that they are seeing to see whether really this is the case or not. So this is really the potential of stem cell work at the moment. We also use embryonic stem, cell, stem cells in the lab, but they are not used for any transplantation purposes whatsoever. Like, I, like all the doctors have said, and I am going to re-emphasize that, these cells have, are amazing little cells. They have lots of potential. It's very, very good to see what can be done with it. But when it comes for treatment purposes, it really is a very, very gray area. These cells, you don't know what exactly is happening to them. Now, we can track them in the lab because we have got several different techniques as to how to do that but we actually don't know what they ultimately become. We don't know whether these cells fully mature, whether they fully, you know, they become old, as it were. You know, are they making the right connections? We don't know any of that. So it is really pointless thinking about a stem cell treatment for a thing like autism, wherein we, A, we don't know what exactly is going wrong to begin with, 
and giving an injection of stem cells intravenously or into the back or wherever take your you know choice of of uh, of um, of of or you know injecting it even into the brain you don't really know what is going to happen to that cell because that cell is a cell that needs to find the right environment it needs to mature it needs to make connections and there's no evidence that that is what is happening in fact there are several there's a lot of work that has been done where they have taken these stem cells injected in, I- injected it into the spine in patients trying to treat als and there has been no effects found whatsoever it is very very hard to make a stem cell coax it like with with whatever trophic factors that you want to add try to get them to differentiate into neurons and then those neurons basically making the right connections it is just not possible one neuron one motor neuron goes from your spine right to the tip of your toe now imagine trying to regrow that it's not possible okay so this is one of the things that you need to take away from this today is that even at the garden institute in cambridge i am not a great person i am just a scientist and i earn my keep doing that job all of even including my boss including all these people who have done all this work but the one thing that we agree on that is very very important is that we really need to tackle diseases at the level of biology not at and at the level of research and not at the level of treatment because we really have no evidence for it okay so i'm going to basically conclude by telling you that using ips cells has given us this you know this this whole f- hope for the future where you can take a patient's own genetic makeup and you can use these neurons to test drugs you can also find out whether you you can also try and identify different variants of autism you know to we know that it is a spectrum we can actually see that now in a dish you can do profiling for genes you can find out lots and lots of information okay but it is n- in no way anything to do with treatment okay it is just a research tool now one of the biggest caveats with this technique is that it can cost up to 100000 us dollars which is about 50000 pounds okay per patient to make these lines so as great as this technique is scientists are also trying to reduce the cost only for biology okay only to find out if there are drugs and to find out whether there are you know there is any hope that we can actually use these cells and like i said and as you saw in in the in the clip that i showed you that these connections between these neurons are very very complex you know it's down to either circuits that you know there are dysfunctional circuits or it is down to the de- defects in individual cells and this is what we are trying to find out at the moment and we just do not know so i'll come back to what i said at the beginning you know so why as a family you know me and my my mom and dad who are here why is it that we never opted for stem cell treatment you know i was as a scientist working in this area for many many years you know i have basically learned everything there has to learn about the basics of it commitment from the parents to bring the kids there in the first place you know you guys should give yourself a pat on the back and a clap you know for yourselves because you are doing an amazing job it's not easy let's face it autism is hard you don't understand what's happening at least in dementia chalo you've forgotten your memory you've lost your memory at least something is gone you know it's easier to deal with that than to deal with this where you cannot help somebody so you know i think that the reason why we really never went for it is because there was no there, there was just no evidence for it we could have easily spent you know how many ever lakhs it takes to you know administer that to her but there was no evidence and we tried to do the best that we could for her so you know the only hope that i can have from you know this evening is that you go away thinking you know that you you that you know enough of information now to make the right choices and don't go in for something that has absolutely no basis whatsoever i just like to stop there with that thank you like i said you are right okay but there's the other side too and believe me i've tried this okay and when you talk you know it's all it's all nice for us to sit and debate here but when you talk to a parent and tell them there's a 50% chance we'll be putting something that does not work parents get angry all right they say how can you you know inject something like you know they say either treat my child or don't treat my child but do not inject saline into my child all right 
into my child's intrathecal. So it's nice for us to sit here. It's all theoretical. And like Dr. Himangi said, I mean, you heard her. She, you know, uh, had she gone by the principles of evidence-based medicine? I mean, you went to John Hopkins, I understand. You went to the best neurologist. But she chose to do this. And uh, I've treated her. So I know. I mean, her condition was much worse. She could not talk at all. Now she can at least talk. And she's improved. And she's doing research. So it's nice for us to uh, be armchair, pro be professors. I'm a professor and, and talk all this, which I used to many years ago. I've been a very, very strong. But then patients have rights. Patients need to make informed consent about what they want to do. And if they believe that there is something right for their children, they should do it. Now, as professionals, what we need to do, we need to be honest. We need to be transparent. We need to follow uh, you know, whatever the principles of, uh, of, of evidence-based medicine that we can. We have done. In ALS, we have done a control study, where, which is published in the American Journal of uh, Dr. Budani, in the American Journal of Stem Cells. We got a study published. The, the results match with that of PGI uh, uh, Chandigarh, because their neurologist has done another study on ALS. There's a study come from a government hospital, and our paper, which is a control study. We actually have a control, which shows there's increase in life, all right? The increase in survival. So uh, we have to understand one thing. We have two options, all right? And fair enough, I understand. We have an option to wait for first class evidence to come. Believe me, even if today, if we start doing it, it'll take at least two weeks. Because you start a trial, it takes funding, it takes uh, and and the, the conditions, there's a new law, the conditions for clinical trials have become very strict. The government insists on insurance. There are a lot of problems. It takes two or three years to finish it, and you have to follow up and get results. Now, the question is, are we willing to wait for two, three years or not? That is the question. Everything here that is being said is completely correct. All right, there's just one more thing. Most of the practices, 90% of modern medical practices, including our vaccines, including our antibiotics, were never tested. This principle of evidence-based medicine, randomized control studies and all that, came from the 1970s. It started with a thalidomide disaster. There was a drug that was used in kids which resulted in problems. So after that, but prior to that, 90%, there was a paper, 90% of all the neurosurgery I do, brain tumor, spine, is not tested by randomized trials. So a lot of medicine evolves by practice. Okay, it evolves as a process where doctors do something, it works, and then they go ahead. The important thing is to be honest, like I showed you, we had complications. We published a paper on complications okay, in International Journal. We said, this is the risk of epilepsy. That is science. Where you publish your good results, you also publish your negative results. And then parents have an informed choice that, OK, do we accept this? Do we not accept this? Yeah. I'm not saying it's a cure. It is, it is a treatment option. And if you saw my conclusions at the end, I said, if you are improving with the present standard of care, do not do it. But if you've done everything possible, and after that, you're still symptomatic, only then do it. Yeah. So I just want to use that. Sure. Um, you know, I just wanted to comment on the use of the word choices, that parents need to have a choice as to whether um, they want to pick a treatment or not, or wait for an RCT. Unfortunately, the situation for us is the backdrop of which we are talking all, uh, in which we are talking about all of this. So, uh, Imangi, it was lovely to hear you talk about um, quality of life because I think that's so important. But I must point out that you had choices that 80% of my patients do not have. Right? They don't have the choice of also having access to neuro rehab therapy and making the choice for an unproven treatment. Right? It's very hard for them to make that choice. And if one seems quicker and easier, and they're not knowledgeable enough, they make that choice. And that, to me, is very, very difficult to see. Right? I think quality of life improves when you empower parents, when you address parental mental health, when you address the ability of the child and the family to go out and be part of the community, when you sensitize communities to differences. Where do we have all those things? Who's investing money in that? Right? We don't have those choices. So when you're making those important choices, I'd like to add that to your choices. You have the choice to choose these versus a quick fix. There is that too. If you take any of these treatments, there are double-blind randomized control trials. So don't do the double-blind randomized control trials, but all of them improve patients' autistic behavior. None of them cure the disease. So I absolutely agree. Maybe stem cell does that. Maybe it improves it for a while. Maybe it does, I'm not sure, maybe it does, but it doesn't cure the problem.
that is the problem and you are claiming unfortunately i just i just saw your neurogen institute then 91% of your patients improve how much do they improve how many of them go back to a normal life how many of them you have to tell us that if you just tell us improve what does the word improve mean there are places where you can you know i, I just i just want to find out about you but please tell us about that uh, 91% is a huge ah uh. It's better than most treatments for diabetes. No, better than any treatment available today. Fine. Uh, I can uh, call some of my uh, patients. Aditya Jagta. Oh, like then, uh, yeah. 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 we had a clause about that because we don't want anecdotes. Okay, okay this sure. Is going to, this is, uh, yeah, so fa fair enough. Uh, now, uh, we have, when we say uh, improvements, we have, we do all the scales, uh, we do documentary evidence, we have clinical improvements, and we, we do follow-up imaging uh, on PET scans and everything else. So we and uh, we are doing a very detailed, elaborate study. So these improvements are objective improvements and clinical improvements made by entire team. They're separate occupational therapists, psychologists, um, so every, everybody does the evaluation, and they're symptomatic improvements. They're dramatic improvements uh, in terms of the education. Uh, very often, the therapists who are treating, the teachers who are treating, tell them of the improvement in their academic performance. Uh, you know, who uh, they've passed their eighth and NOS board exams. One of our first kids who's not here actually improved so much that now he can, he and this is very interesting. He now actually uh, teaches deaf children uh, maths. He's he's become you know uh, somebody with autism has actually started uh, because they uh, people with uh, you know kids with autism have and a great ability to communicate with the deaf. No, but Alok, um, here again, it doesn't prove that the stem cell has worked. What you're trying to say, there's therapy going on simultaneously, there's other procedures going on simultaneously. How do you tell us? I mean, you're trying to say there's improvement, improvement, improvement. The word is improvement. It's a rel very relative term. How do you, unless you had a, a, a control, and you may have had an Asperger's child and he showed improvement. You may have had a child who's just touching the spectrum and now he's teaching the deaf children. The, there has to be parameters that you go by which goes with it. And if it's only hyperactivity and we're spending thousands or lakhs of rupees on hyperactivity, I can give you a medication which will cut the hyperactivity. I can improve the quality of life with other more reasonable Amendable, I can take it off. God mm -hmm. forbid if you don't have a re good reaction to it, which I cannot take out of your system. God forbid if anything goes amiss. So there are alternative, cheaper treatment options. But to say that this is giving you 91 and you publish 91, you know what it does to a parent that this is like the ultimate cure for my child. Come on. But if you say 91% improvement. What, what we said is 91% of our patients showed clinical improvement on the various scales. If they did, they did. May I just say one thing? Yeah. I need to say this on behalf of all the parents. In fact, I was asking some parent to speak okay. about it, but I happen to be okay. in the front row, so I'm doing it. Our children are not classically, all of them, aggressive, hyperactive. 99.99% of the times, if this is their behavior, mm -hmm. the cause of it is something else. It is because something else has happened that their anxiety levels are out of their control and it comes out in that way because they have an issue with communication. Mm -hmm. And this is the way they used to communicate because it is the way that works fastest with people like us, neurotypical people like us. So as a parent support group, we would not like our children to be called aggressive. Very clearly said, if your child is responding, improving with conventional therapies and treatments, please do not take stem cell therapy. What did I say? I said, despite everything, because whether you like it or not, a lot of kids, a lot of the children, or parents who come to us have severe hyperactivity. I mean, they have violence. They, they, they do scratch. They do headbang. They hurt themselves. They scratch. It's a fact. I know. And, and what I'd like you to do, I'd welcome, I'd welcome the Forum for Autism to come and study our raw data. Our data is open for everyone. Come and study our data. Talk to our parents. Okay, because we are transparent. Everything of ours is in the public domain. Nothing is hidden. Our complications in the public domain. Come and talk to our parents. Talk to a parent whose child is continuously head banging and that head banging stops. What a relief it is. Talk to a mother whose child is scratching their sister all the time and it completely stops. It is, it is, why can, why do we take, why, what, and, and, uh, Anaita, just for, you know, because you asked about therapy, these people have taken all the therapies. Okay, they've taken everything possible, taken all the medications. They come to us only as a last resort and, 
This is a question we ask them if they are improving with this thing and, and our thing is, is he able to do activities of daily living? If they are, we don't recommend it. But if despite everything else, a child is still suffering, the parents are still suffering, here is a treatment option that's scientifically validated. We have enough proof. It is published in paper. Uh, it, it's published from Mumbai, so we don't respect it. The same thing I'm telling you had been published from Stanford or Harvard today. Everybody would be doing it. But because it is, no, it's because it's come from Mumbai. No, it's true. It's true. Because it has come from Mumbai, it doesn't have the same, huh? Uh, Dr. Unani, you just said, wait for the result for U.S. trial to come. And that trial is only a medical call. Ours is autologous bone marrow. They have no match. So th that's the thing. So I think that's an unfair statement. I was just talking about that you must have large trials control. Forget about this. I, I agree with Alok that we cannot have randomized control trials for everything. Absolutely agree. But there should be some rationale. There should be some basis of treatment. There should be some results which are accepted by most. If this thing has been going on since 2007, it's almost eight years, nine years that stem cells have been given in autism. Why isn't the world using it? Why isn't everybody saying that stem cells is the ultimate answer in autism? Why is it that it's not happening? People like, oh, oh you know, all of autism parents are upset and uh, there's no treatment available. All over the world people are. So why, why is it not? Because the world is very commercial. Why is why I agree? Why? Why? Because US is only money minded and they are no no then wait wait wait. Umbilical corn is cotton. But it is not as safe as autologous bone marrow. In autologous bone marrow mononucleus, and there are no companies involved. There are no drug company, no commercialization. Only doctors are there and patients are there. So nobody is even interested in it. In umbilical cord, thousands and millions of dollars are at stake. They want to make money. I'm sorry, I want, to, I want to ask one question. How can you explain to me scientifically when you are taking a defective, genetically defective cell and injecting it back into that same person, like a Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, or tomorrow if autism finds out which cells it is, how do you explain that as um, a treatment option? You know, before we go into the science and they answer that, I do want to respond to something that you said about everybody in the U.S. being money-minded. Autism Speaks has plenty of money. They don't need more money from you. They are a parent organization started by grandparents, right? The rights were grandparents of a child with autism. They happen to be wealthy. They got the money. Today, it's the largest funder of autism research. They fund stem cell research. The head of medical research there has just given you a response which says, yes, this is great research, but that's what it is. It's not yet proven and not yet safe to be used as treatment. That's the most important take home we need. All right, so I want to explain a few things. What uh, I want to clarify what Dr. Imangi was saying. Uh, uh, maybe you people aren't aware but today, 95% of all medical advances, which is accepted as evidence-based medicine, comes from clinical trials funded by the industry. Because today, a clinical trial takes anywhere up to $500 million to do. It's very expensive. People like me can't afford it, all right? So it's very difficult to do clinical trials because it's very expensive. But companies have the money. So bone marrow, what we are doing, bone marrow autologous, no company will support it, and so nobody's going to be able to build that, that class of evidence, whereas for other commercially available cells, that is possible. Now, this, the second thing, just to answer your, your question, I, you know, this is just a background. It's, uh, in, in America, there's a group of associates, you know, like you have Forum for Autism, they have a, a group which is the Duchenne Alliance, and it's a group of 25 different uh, NGOs uh, working on muscular dystrophy. You know, I, I feel proud to say that these people, and they're all parent-driven organizations. Each organization is headed by a parent. They studied cell therapy done all over the world, over two years. And then, I'm very proud to say, identified us as, this, as a collaborative partner. 
the head of the they first came they saw a center then he brought this child treated and now no and and now we are partnering with them so the work in america is a partnered by us what's the now the science is okay so the science is and you please you know you're welcome to come i'll show you all the data you know our data is available the main thing is release of nerve growth factors in autism it is bdnf we have identified bdnf as the triggering factor we've got 300 pet and mri studies we are we are studying the natural history of the disease we are uh, correlating eeg with uh, with with pet with functional mri with the clinical correlations seeing which areas are damaged with the disease we've got this awesome data this changes the genetic code of it doesn't autism. change that no, all autism is not genetic Reds is genetic most autism and we are not no, trying no, to cure no, this no, 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 we are no, causing no, functional no, no, improvements this, this anaita is a scientific fact no, no. see it's, it's it is okay one minute wait. you problem. just it's mentioned genetic. one minute she, tanya just said tanya what did you say Factors. Yeah, yeah, that's it. We do not know as of yet yeah. what causes exactly. Autism. We huh? do not know that. Can I, can I, can I just ask you one very simple question? Yeah. You're taking stem cells yeah. from the bone marrow, yeah. injecting it back into patients. Mm. Okay, it is auto, it is auto autologous, yeah. which means that it potentially should not be a threat to the patient. Absolutely. Yeah. But what exactly is happening to the cells? Autism is a brain disorder. It is affecting. The, you know, it's affecting an organ which is up here. Mm. You're injecting the cells here. Mm. Now you're expecting okay. the stem cell to home into which area? And do what exactly? Okay, so shall I'll explain because to that. You when we put it intrathecally... You but you're also mm. making the claim that you're tackling underconnectivity. Mm. Now underconnectivity is happening here. Mm. So how, how is that happening? I'll explain that. So how there is research, so I'll explain to you. So there are, there are research papers where, which have shown with MR, with, you can take these yeah. cells, tag them with nanoparticles and dyes, and inject them intrathecally. Okay, so th this is the basis of our work. And when you inject them, the moment you inject them, the interesting, whenever there is an area of the brain that's damaged, it releases certain chemo signals. It's like a cry for help. All right. So uh, the sorry, sorry. That, is some, that is research work. That's how it really should be happening. But that's not what you are doing. That's yeah. what you're doing. Yeah. You're taking a person's stem cell. Firstly, it's autologous. So yeah. the number of stem cells is relatively limited. You mm. are not multiplying them. You are not growing them. You are not making them into 100,000 and mm. then putting them in. The chance of those 10 stem cells which were in the bone marrow that you aspirated becoming a brain stem cell is 1% or 2% at the end of the day. The, 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 just, that is research is showing you tagged cells. That's what I meant. Okay, what, what if, no, I'm she asked me what happens when you inject in the back. I said when you inject in the CSF, these cells, women, and they have in the MRIs, they have found that all the cells are found around the damaged area. Okay, and I'll, I'll, I'll send you that paper. Which, which is? Which is what the brain which the is body what? does normally. No, no, no. Anyway. no, no. Like, we don't know the damaged area. We know the damaged area. I've got 300 scans. You didn't see my lecture properly. I, I totally saw your lecture. I was watching it. Okay, now, no, okay. okay. So, okay. so the. A pet, so the scan, a pet scan is the, is exactly that. It's a pet scan. It okay. doesn't tell it you shows the reality you, it, of oh, why oh. autism happens. Okay, it, it tells you that there are parts of the brain which are functioning subnormally and is the cause for the symptoms because we are actually now correlating the damaged areas with the symptoms and we are finding is one to one correlation so can you come and see it please come and see our data please come and see our data so, yeah. is it possible then to actually see the stem cells homing into that area? Yes. Oh, I think, I okay, so we have, you know, in, in, muscular, in muscular dystrophy, we are doing something called muscle DTI, okay? And this is data which is validated by American radiologists. Before our tie-up with America, we have a tie-up with America now, okay? So, we are providing them the service. Think, uh, Their radiologists studied our data. Can we just yeah. a point? Yeah. I think... You know, you can argue to the cows come mm -hmm. home. I mean, th th these are all scientific arguments and all this kind of thing. Just anybody has any questions, please. Yeah, ask questions. I mean, we should do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think we should ask more questions instead of us discussing. <laughs>
तो अगर मैं पेरेंट हूँ तो कौन सा चॉइस मैं करूँगी सेकेंड चॉइस आपका बराबर नहीं है हम आपको ओपीडी में एक घंटा बिता के पूरा प्रोटोकॉल साइड इफेक्ट्स द वेट इज डन वट ऑल इन्फॉर्मेशन टोटल इन्फॉर्मेशन फर्स्ट का जो पर वही पेरेंट जब आपके क्लिनिक में आते हैं तो वो तीन लाख चार लाख चार लाख रुपया फेक के वही इन्फॉर्मेशन सुन के विलिंगली साइन करके दे अग्री टू दैट पर मैं पैसे कोई पैसा फेंकता नहीं ओके दूसरा पेरेंट्स चाहे फ्री देखो चाहे ओके सो सो वेदर सी एवरी पेरेंट हैज ओनली वन इंटरेस्ट ओके दे मे बी इंटरेस्टेड इन रिसर्च एंड एवरीथिंग एल्स बट एट द एंड ऑफ द डे दे वॉन्ट दर चाइल्ड टू बी वेल ओके सो पेरेंट्स वेदर वी डू फ्री और नॉट देन चांस है आप कुछ और डालोगे दैट इज वॉट आई सेट वो ट्रायल अलग है थेरेपी अलग है क्लिनिकल ट्रायल इज सेपरेट थेरेपी इज सेपरेट वी आर डूंग क्लिनिकल ट्रायल्स आर रिसर्च थेरेपी इज सेपरेट मतलब वो ट्रायल ट्रायल नहीं होगा अभी नहीं का हमने कोशिश की थी द रेजिस्टेंस फॉर प्लेसिबो कंट्रोल वाज सो मच दैट वी वी टू डिसकंटिन्यू पेरेंट्स सो फ्यूरियस अभी ट्रायल नहीं चल रहा है अभी हम अभी हम ट्रीटमेंट करते हैं ट्रायल नहीं कर रहे अभी हम ट्रायल नहीं कर रहे वी आर नॉट सींग मैंने क्योर वर्ड नहीं यूज किया क्योर क्योर कभी यूज नहीं किया I said functional improvements, <laughs> symptomatic improvement. Hello, yeah, I'm Dr. Krishan. I'm an occupational therapist. Like uh, most parents, you know, they must be asking their therapist whether we should go for stem cell or we shouldn't. Hmm. Likewise, many parents ask me. Uh, from what I have understood so far, I tell them that okay, this is the science. You have to figure it out, and there is no evidence per se. The question which I was asked by the parent was, okay, suppose if there is evidence, so positive evidence after a few years, do you think I am I have missed the train? Okay, see, this is a very valid question. Okay. I have no answer to this. I, I will answer. See, our our own research shows. that uh rough the earlier we treat i mean the younger it's a common sense basically the 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 earlier the we treat we get better results you know the older the child the results are little less so in that 91% the 10% patients who didn't improve were people who were of a older age so it is a fact but it is not strictly rigid waiting for 1 2 years yeah. or so does not make any difference but overall the earlier we treat like any disease any disease okay the earlier you treat it you are likely to get a better result अबाउट द जेनेटिक थिंग बिकॉज दे वॉज लॉट ऑफ डिबेट अबाउट जेनेटिंग द जेनेटिक दैट मीन कॉज द एबनॉर्मल अनहर कनेक्टिविटी सो नाउ अवर चिल्ड्रेन हैव दैट अनहर कनेक्टिविटी बट नाउ मैन माई स्टेप सेल्स गो दे दे आर नॉट गो टू चेन द जीन so even if my infant has those preliminary perinatal gene defect even then they will have the paracrine effect the paracrine effect is release of cytokine and the growth factor which will cause the connectivity so the autologous cells will not have Uh, I forgot what I was going to say, <laughs> but I'll tell you one thing, Doctor Sane. I, I must, I must admit that she's very convinced about how stem cells work in autism. 
You know, when I was preparing for this, I did a lot of reading. I still don't know there's nobody else in the world who's as well informed in autism and stepsis as you are, madam. I'm How? I'm searching for that. No, but this where? where what I'm saying is. Because we don't know, one minute, one minute, one, the, the problem of underconnectivity. She used my argument saying that underconnectivity is helped by autism. Underconnectivity, we don't know why it happens in autism. Underconnectivity is only in long distance pathways. In short distance pathways, which is from one part of the brain very close to another part of the brain, is very well connected. In fact, maybe hyperconnected. One minute, one minute, one, let me finish. Okay, it's hyperconnected brains, very short distance pathways. Poor dist long distance pathway is poorly connected. Okay, that is the reason why many autistic children have these tremendous gifts. They can be very good in music or whatever it is because the short connections are very good. Now, the, 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 the genes which make these connections have been identified. Three or four of them have how to make the connections. They are involved. So if your genes are defective, you can't make those connections. Now you tell me that the genetically defective cell in autism is helping the connectivity. Please explain, madam. Uh, there is no way you can explain Dr. that. You know what? We can keep going on and I'm just yeah. getting basically what you're saying is that the research you're doing because it is not involving embryonic thing, it is different. We get that. I think we need to wind it. Does anyone have a last question? Anybody wants to say anything? I think we have just two questions. No, no, let them continue. We don't mind staying at nine. No problem. Yeah. I'll take responsibility. Uh, Dr. Alok Sharma has shown in his uh, presentation some uh, scans, brain scans. The brain scan, he has shown that this is before autism and after autism. So can't that be used as a evidence? That is stem cell therapy and after stem cell. We have kids who have not spoken for 8-9 years and after therapy start talking. I cannot understand after taking the best speech therapy, the best occupational therapy, you've never opened your mouth and now you start talking. How can that be a placebo effect and the speech in the brain, you can actually see that area improving. This is evidence. Excuse me, Dr. Alok Sharma. Yeah. This one, I'm a Rashmi Desai here, occupational therapist. Yeah. We have got patients, I'm from Jaiwaki School. Yeah. There were children who have received stem cell therapy and they were being told that they have to take all the therapies of course they have to. very regularly. Yes. Post stem cell of course they have to take. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Totally agreed. Yeah. But after stem cell therapy, they have to take this therapy so vigorously that they have been taking so many years. There was parents were religiously giving therapy. Yeah. After uh, that, they have been told that because the therapy may not be vigorous, the, the justification given for not good improvement is jeopardizing the existence what we are right now arguing. No, no. What See, what we Patients believe... We have paid enormous amount. Hmm. Maybe for the whole life they would have paid 2 lakh rupees for therapy. They pay in one shot. And then if they... You. See, see what we the see. Of course, we have to take therapy. See, what we have found is that with stem cell therapy, the effect of the therapy Doctor, is improved. It's a research. It's not a treatment. As per the Helsinki Declaration, which is the basis of stem cell Helsinki therapy worldwide, it says for things, things, it says for which there is no treatment option, you may use an unproven therapy. There are treatment options, sir. No, everything is. So so they are not. Is, is please is note, we do not. We. Do not treat children if they are already improving. We treat children where after everything they are still uh, you know they still again doctor, they are putting a condition. They have to take this, this Of this course they have to take therapy. Yeah, uh, it's like you are, uh, you are saying if I feed my child only rice, he should remain healthy. No, for the complete improvement you need Talking about no. Okay, culture. let's ask parents. Parents, yeah, please. Yeah, I just yeah. had a point to make yeah. today after listening to all of you. Yeah. What I feel is that stem, stem cells should be posi positioned as a research. It should not be called a stem cell therapy or a treatment. That is the best thing. I, as a parent of an autistic child, I would voluntarily support any research towards it. 
I can even, I can even bring the paper. But I have to know that this is research. So when I'm going to release it, I know that it can be true or it can be false. False. But if a, you can never it. reach me, I will have an extra hope that I'm going to see some positive results. That is unethical, I see. So I you're, you're, you're correct from your point of view. The question that you raised, that the two options, you come and tell me that I want to take your child for a research. I will agree to that. That, okay, I'm a mother of uh, a child with autism. I'm very curious to know what is the reason behind it. But all the doctors are struggling to find out. So if you tell me it's a stem cell research, I'm very much for it. But if you tell me it's a stem cell treatment and there has been no evidence as everybody is saying, then that is not right. That's completely, you're completely right. You're absolutely right, but that's your point of view. And there may be parents who have another point of view. I think we have to respect the parents' views. But that's all. Yeah. Uh, we are not saying we are doing research with your children anymore. We are giving treatment. For us, it is no more research. But there is no proof. How can you say there is no research? See, the yardsticks, for example. There is no proof. No, okay. No, no. Someone is that paper, please tell us that. No, no. This is playing with words. No, 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 no. If you are claiming treatment, then you will declare with software research, no more research papers from us. No, no, I... Uh, I don't see, see, research, and this has to happen... Sim what are we researching? We are researching the natural history of the disease. We are studying PET scans correlating with MRI and EEG. That is back-end research that's happening. Uh, Dr. Dhani, when oh, you mentioned, yeah, agree. yeah, I think the research and the and, and have have to go on simultaneously. Go together without yeah. a conflict of interest. Yeah. Our only problem is yeah. that I think let us you know cut down the commercial part of this and let us do a research together. I have no problem. Yeah? I have no problem. <laughs> you know, if we, we we you know if a clinical trial is done, and I think you know the two of you are perfectly positioned to do that. See, my problem. Is patients when they come to me, they come asking for stem cell therapy. Patients who come to you don't come asking for stem cell therapy. So when you put them randomized, they will agree. I think you should do it. And there's enough funding available. The government of India has got crores of unutilized money. The Department of Biotechnology. You should do randomized trials. Maybe not placebo control. Maybe just randomized. Just you know, uh, just take controls of non-treatments. But I think you should do it. I think you know the two of you should do it definitely. We'll support it. We'll support it completely. Yeah. Uh, one parent, she has come from Delhi yeah. and she signed research papers to uh, do the stem cell treatment for her son. Huh? She paid 2.5 lakhs and yeah. she didn't see any improvement in the child. Mm -hmm. Then she was told she has to do 6-7 times more the stem cell treatment again. From Delhi? So, in Delhi? Okay, so th see, there are all kinds of people in Delhi. They use embryonic stem cells, and I, I don't agree with those. I, I don't believe in any. No, no, she did it with you. She had to go over here. Six, seven times? Nobody, we never do six, seven times. We do one time. That's, uh, that's wrong that information. No, the, no, no. The thing is, personally, we, can, we yeah. don't know what the truth of that is. Yeah, we don't know what the truth uh, of that is. What my point is, yeah. that this PET scan. Now, this to just tell you. PET scan, nobody has done before and after three months of intensive therapy. Maybe we should do research. Exactly. On that. I think we and should. Find that the I think we should. I think we should. This is the problem. No? When you say when you say control, you don't have to give him the CSF for uh, do a CSF I think so. I think you can give him only therapy. But yes, I think we should do it. No problem. And see what the difference is in pet scans as well. So what I'm saying is no pet scan. It was thirty thousand rupees. 15,000 pre-pet scan, the post-pet scan is 15,000, 30,000 You know, it's too expensive. So I think what we need to I, do I completely agree. Agree that we should do funding. Maybe the forum of autism can help us get funding. Yeah, absolutely. We are no actually doing it for spinal cord injury at Neurogen. We are doing for spinal cord injury a clinical trial uh, where patients don't pay anything at all, where there is only therapy and therapy plus stem cell therapy, you know. And uh, we are doing this right now. We've got ethical clearance. We've got separate funding for it. So we've started doing that already. We are doing it with spinal cord injury. And uh, yeah, I so think the point is that research must and should happen, but should not be paid for by parents who think they're treating their child. That's if, if it's a clinical trial, parents can't pay. There's no question. We can try and say it is succeeded or not succeeded. It comes in multiple flavors, multiple mm -hmm. you know, horizontal, as well as vertical, 
Uh, there's no exact No, that is not accepted. That, that's not accepted by. Randomization means into which group he goes. That's all. Okay, okay. After that, I understand this. Uh, mm. That's what I'm saying. I think the discussion about the important thing is that we can't treat them in the same way as, as, as we do. I agree with you. This is not whether it works or it doesn't work. It actually, every kid is different. Every person is different. But that is very important. But the question is every person with every disease. I completely agree with you. And what you say, very interestingly, you know, the, the Japanese government, you have to read the new law. They, they are using exactly your words. And what they have said is that for these diseases, you cannot use conventional methods. And so they have made an alternate fast track method of approving. So the Japanese government, you have to read the law. They say exactly what you're saying, that you cannot follow the conventional systems for cell therapy, the diseases it can benefit. So you're right. Yeah. Uh, I think there are ways to measure changes in children with autism. So long as you have a baseline and you have an end line, there are ways of measuring it. But also we need to make sure that we are measuring the changes equally across both groups. And, and the other thing is, I sometimes wonder whether just measuring how many times a child made eye contact is progress, or do you look at a more global measure like family functioning? I really think that's an important measure. So, I mean, again, comes back to the issue of quality of life. Okay, I want to make one, I, I want to make an offer to Dr. Udani and Anaita that I and my team, or to you. I'm devastated. That, that me, my entire team will offer our complete stem cell expertise free of cost for any clinical trial they do in their hospitals to do randomized controlled studies and to get to the bottom of the truth, we will offer our complete services and expertise. I'm offering that on, on this platform. So we will come to your hospital, we will make the cells, we will do everything. Of course, you'll have to see that your institute permits us because that will be real data. I'm absolutely confident that that data will show. It'll be free of cost. We won't charge anything for it. 